Support for your voice, Addicted, comes from Edison State College with campuses in Lee, Collier, Charlotte counties and a center serving Hendry and Glades. Edison State College, discover your genius. Hello, I'm Rochelle Grossman and this is Your Voice, our WGCU broadcast where we take a week-long in-depth look at an issue on TV and radio and then you become part of the program. Tonight we're talking about addiction, the public health crisis with the power to tear apart families and destroy lives. We want to hear from you as well to know how drugs or alcohol has affected your life. So at any time during this live broadcast, we invite you to call 1-800-809-WGCU to have your voice heard. Sadly, the numbers are pretty staggering. Estimates of the total cost of substance abuse in the United States are more than a half trillion dollars. Illicit drugs, alcohol, and tobacco all play a part. And then here in Southwest Florida, well, it's the sale, distribution, and exportation of prescription drugs that's taking over. The pretty palms, seemingly endless sunshine, and warm, sandy beaches portray the good life. But underneath this postcard-perfect paradise, a hidden problem has the potential of as much destruction as a Class 5 hurricane. America's number one public health crisis is shattering lives at a staggering cost. Alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, crack, heroin, and now overtaking them all, prescription pill abuse. I've never seen this much opiate addiction. People who would never ever have thought about using illicit drugs are finding themselves with a drug problem today. The drugs just took over, just took over. You don't even think about stealing. You just do it because you just need those drugs. And that's all you think about 24 hours a day is when can I get more? And how am I going to get more? How am I going to pay for more? And screw everybody else. Experts say South Florida is home to a flourishing pain management industry that is the prime source of illegal prescription drug exportation in the United States. Problems from these doctor-prescribed, highly addictive and powerful narcotics are eclipsing the evils popularized from the cocaine-fueled Miami Vice era of the 1980s. South Florida's dirty little secret is dubbed the Flamingo Express, with thousands of addicted neighbors traveling many miles to get their fix at the nearly 1,000 statewide pain clinics. Drug treatment centers are inundated with people needing help, Law enforcement officers are working around the clock to keep these pills off of our streets and visits to hospital emergency rooms for non-medical use of prescription narcotic pain relief is skyrocketing. Are we a society continually looking for a quick fix in a bottle? And what can be done to stop a potential prescription pill pandemic? And the truth is, we set out to do a show on the state of addiction locally. We didn't expect to find one problem trumping all of the others, the prescription pain pill crisis. And tonight, we welcome a panel of experts to talk about all of this. Kevin Lewis is the Chief Executive Officer of Southwest Florida Addiction Services, or SWAFIS. He is also appointed to serve on the statewide Drug Policy Advisory Council. Brenda Eiliff is an author and expert on addiction. She is also the Director of Clinical Services for the newly opened Hazelden Recovery Center in Naples. Leslie Yount is a mother and marketing professional who shockingly found herself addicted to prescription drugs. She is now clean and sober and shares her story with us. And Dr. Leonard Lado is a medical doctor, a registered pharmacist, as well as a board-certified psychiatrist, specializing in treatments to overcome addiction. He is affiliated with the Willow at Naples Treatment Center and heads the Lado Healing Institute in Benita Springs. Thank you all for being here. We welcome your thoughts. Real quickly, to just get us started here, Kevin, let's start with you. How bad is the addiction to prescription medicine here locally? It's become the biggest problem we face in our treatment system right now, Rochelle. Mm, very bad. Brenda, what are you saying? We're saying we used to see mostly alcoholics, and we still see a lot of that, but we see a, a ton of people that are addicted to narcotics. Leslie, I'd like you to share your story a little bit. Um, you had some back pain issues mm -hmm. and then got I prescribed it and quickly found yourself hooked. Yes, I, I had never really used any, I had never used any drugs before, and um, when I did have pain management issues, I was prescribed medication, and 
it's a control. And Dr. Lato, you must be seeing so many people yeah. coming to you for help. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bigger than I think the uh, greenhouse effect and the uh, oil spill. I think there's more addiction problems and I think uh, the other concerns I, you see at the surface. In fact, six people a day right now in our state are dying of prescription drug overdoses. Just let that sink in for a minute. Six people a day. Now, if this were six manatees being washed up on the beach every day, I think it might be all over the news. But the fact is, these are humans. Kevin, why is this kind of flying under the radar a little bit? I think there's a lot of discomfort when we talk about addiction. People don't mm. appreciate it as a chronic disease. It's a brain-based problem. They really think it's a weakness or a uh, shortcoming the person has. Mm. And Brenda, this is one of those issues where you can't just stereotype it. This prescription pain crisis really is affecting all walks of life, gender. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really anyone's problem. Absolutely. Your doctor even absolutely. is addicted. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see people that are the most educated in the country and people that have never, you know, been able to have any education or might be able to own the country and take care of that oil spill and other people who have, just don't have any, any resources. Addiction is no respecter of persons. Leslie, talk to me a little bit about from when you first took the pill, how long it took your body to physically feel the need that you wanted more. Oh, well, for me, it, it, was, it was instantly. As soon as I had taken um, the medication, I knew that I had found the piece that I had been missing for all that time. And what did it make you feel like? Um, what was the high, I guess, like? Well, for me, it was, it was um, you know, freedom. It was, it was euphoric. It was just relief. You could finally breathe. Right. It's relief. Okay. And um, what were you prescribed, if I may ask? Um, originally, I had started with um, Oxycontin, and I actually got very, very, very hooked on fentanyl. Okay. Well, let's do a little history lesson now. In the 80s, we had heard all about cocaine and crack. In the 90s, there was certainly a mix of alcohol and other illicit drugs. Dr. Lato, why are we seeing this pain pill problem here? Why are everyday people being addicted to these types of medications? They don't want to feel. They don't know how to deal with pain the way there used to be a way. I think that it's an easy way to deal with a lot of issues. And I think opioids not only alleviate physical pain, they numb your emotional pain. Mm. Kevin, let's talk a little bit about the moniker that Florida unfortunately now has. We're called the pill mill state, which means people from other states are now coming to the pain clinics here to get their drugs and taking them back. Mm -hmm. Why have we gotten this moniker? We've gotten that moniker due to real le loose regulations around the, both the prescription and the disposing or this dispersing of those medications. Mm -hmm. 48 of the top 50 physicians in the United States that prescribe Oxycontin practice in Florida. We don't have that much pain. There's just not enough strong yeah. state. Yeah, the, the rules have been, frankly, too lax, and you could set up a pain clinic uh, and make a profit. It's been but a very profitable endeavor. Diving into that new legislation, because mm -hmm. we this spring recently passed, was some new legislation approving stricter rules for these pain clinics targeting maybe doctor shoppers and these so-called pill mills, because there's some legitimate pain mm -hmm. clinics that are operating out there, but certainly there's some that might be in it for profit, Ken? Yeah, what we found is, unfortunately, there are folks that will do it for a profit. And, and two years ago, our legislature passed a pharmaceutical prescription drug registry program, but didn't fund it. Right. Uh, pretty fascinating, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry and, and individuals that want to make a profit. So now we've passed a new legislation that says I can only give someone three days prescription if they're a cash customer. Uh, we anticipate what will happen is the cost for the visit will go up dramatically and they'll give away the medication. Mm, so there's a loophole there. Yeah. It's like a paper tiger, a, a law on the mm -hmm. books, but no way to fund it, so really no way to enforce it. Correct. What I found interesting is Lee County has 25 pain management clinics. I read somewhere that we have 16 Wendy's and 9 Walmarts. Now, certainly in Florida, we know, Dr. Lado, that there is a higher number of seniors, so Correct. it might be a few more people that are in pain. Uh, but I tell you, I went to some of these pain clinics personally, mm -hmm. and it's not an overwhelming majority of Correct. the elderly. Uh, there's people my age. Correct. Is there so many people in pain? Do we need 25 of them here in Lee County? I don't think so. And I think that uh, uh, the gentleman made a very good point regarding that there is uh, a lot of clinics who are doing it for profit. And I think that the hopefully with this new legislation, uh, a lot of things will change.
mm. but there's not such, such a high need to have uh, as many centers as we have here. Okay, we do want to remind you it's a live show here tonight, so at any point in the broadcast, we welcome you to call that number you see on the bottom of your screen. The panelists are here to answer your questions or maybe to just point you in the right direction. Uh, we also want you to know that abuse can be fatal, and when used in high doses, these opioid types of medications can depress your respiration and even cause death. So if you mix this with alcohol, well, certainly it's going to make it even more deadly. Take a look at this statistic. According to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, 169 people died from drug overdoses in Lee County during the first six months of last year. Of those, 82% involved prescription drugs, mostly opiates like oxycodone. Many addicts want help. Many find it hard to stop. And here now is the very personal story of an addict I interviewed facing the fact that his dependence on prescription drugs could end his life. If I don't stop, I probably won't be here for another couple of months. Six months maybe is what the last doctor told me. These are the frightened words of an addict. We'll call him John. I have gotten this deep into this addiction over the last month that I am sabotaging my life. Down to his last oxycodone pill, John can think of little more than getting more. You can't hold anything down. You, you can't even take a sip of water and hold it down. You, you know, you're so sick. Actually, I'm getting a little sick now because I've only got one pill and this is what I've got left. John's track marks are the painful reminders of his abuse. He doesn't swallow his pills. Today, he'll crush the last one and snort it like cocaine. Taking the drug this way speeds its effect. Now, I'm not much of a snorter person because of my headaches. It will make my headaches worse. Usually, John cooks his medicine in this spoon, adds a little water, and shoots up. It speeds up the high and you'll do anything because the withdrawals from this, because they don't tell you that you're going to become an addict. You are going to become an addict. These pills, these oxys, roxys, dilaudid, the whole nine yards, and I've said this many, many times, does not need to be prescribed outside of a medical facility. If I need this, then I need to be put into the hospital, and I need to be weaned off of this before I leave there. John shows us just how many prescriptions for all different kinds of drugs he has. He likes the euphoria from the oxycodone best. A recent trip to the East Coast for more nearly ended in death. And you're sick and you're out driving because you're trying to find it and you're sicker than a dog and you have an accident or you're a danger to people. Drunk drivers, I mean, it's no different than being a drunk driver. You shouldn't be on the streets driving when you're sick or on these medications. John is choosing to speak out to show people the problem. Despite his addiction, he's frustrated the drugs are so readily available. You're supposed to trust these people and what they say to you. So when they hand you a little pill like this, and they say, this is what you need, and you need to take this every three hours as needed, and you don't need it, and an hour later, you're so damn sick, and you don't know what the hell it is, and you have to take this, and all of a sudden, you're okay. Prescription right now for utter misery. Kevin, we were just talking. It's amazing how when your body has that physiological pull, that addiction, mm -hmm. you take the pill and you're fine. Talk to us about, is this the type of addict we're seeing now? Yeah, it's a function of brain chemistry, actually. The brain craves the substance in the, in the medicine, sure. in this case, and the person will literally do anything to get it. And without it, they'll go into withdrawal. That can be life-threatening in certain cases with benzodiazepines and alcohol, but certainly can be so miserable with the, uh, the opioids that they'll do anything to seek the use of the medication. Mm. And as we saw in that piece, people are not necessarily taking it in pill form. Oh, no. So they're you know, smoking the boat, they're shooting it, they're snorting it. Does this, I know it speeds the high, but does this cause any additional problems? Oh, sure. You create a number of health problems with that and other related health problems when you use needles and, and when you snort things intranasally. So you have all kinds of complications that it creates. We were talking in 15 years ago in 95, you said 5% of the detox patients that went to Swafis mm -hmm. were addicted to pain meds. Fast forward to 2010, 
70 percent of SWAFIS mm -hmm. is now prescription pain pill addicted, and they're young people, Kevin. Well, yeah, it's a much younger group. It looks like my children now, yeah. rather than folks my age. Uh, we used to detoxify typically a white male between 45 and 55. Now we're seeing both young men and women, predominantly white, uh, and typically in their 20s and early 30s. How have you had to change your approach to care? Oh, we've had a change to new medications to use to help to assist people through withdrawal, new counseling strategies. And, we, and, it's a, and it's a population, I think Dr. Lato said earlier, that doesn't really want to feel discomfort. They don't want to feel anxiety. They don't want to feel physical discomfort nor emotional discomfort. And you have to teach people those are normal parts of the human experience. Mm. And again, we want to remind you that we'd really love to hear from you. We already have a call from Jane and Benita Springs. And uh, Dr. Lato, let me ask you this. Jane wants to know, what can a family do if someone they love has an addiction problem? There are three obstacles they have to overcome. First, the stigma. We're so stigmatized to get help for any issues of mental illness or drug addiction. The second thing is the denial, another obstacle for the human being. And the third one, which is probably the most important one, the desire to change, because they can go to the best and they will not change. So those three have to come from the individual. Leslie, talk to me about your desire to change. What made you seek recovery? Uh, well, actually, my husband came up to me and he said, you know, I, I see that you got more fentanyl and you need to either quit it or leave um, because we had a one-year-old son at home. And uh, I said, go ahead and take my son and go. Mm. I, so the I desire know. for the drug was that strong? It was. I was willing to, to let go of my husband and my, and my baby yeah. like that. And I, but, I remember saying to him, but leave the drugs. But you did seek treatment, Leslie. You I did. Got, yeah. So you have a happy ending to your story and perhaps can, you know, kind of be a, a beacon of hope for people out there that m may be sharing that walk with you. Yes. And, and a lot of people don't look at me and, and see what society has deemed as a typical drug addict. So I think people are, are, are shocked and sometimes relieved to be able to relate mm. to that. Brenda, Bill from Fort Myers wants to know what the wait lists are like for, for treatment. It depends on where you call. Some places you could get in the day of. Others, if publicly funded, there might be a little bit longer wait list. You could sweep, speak to SWAFIS. Um, it's also important that people get to the, the level of treatment that they need. So if they need some strong physiological detox, they might want to go more towards a hospital type based. Or Some people need outpatient treatment where they come two, three times a week and live in their homes if they live in a safe home environment. But looking at it clinically, where does the person belong in the treatment settings. So maybe the message is don't be afraid to s just make those calls. Call, yes. Take that risk because if not, you could lose the person. Right, right. And if you're a family member, t express your concern. That's what started you to get help, Leslie, was your, your husband said no. You know, when the family starts to say, say no, the addict many times starts to look at their recovery. So. Okay. And did you get kind of maybe scared straight? I did. I had a lot of things going wrong in my life, and um, I was really upset that everybody was doing all these horrible things to me. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but what I, I found out that was it was I was doing things to sure. ruin my life. Well, much like you said, Leslie, I think what's different about this pill addiction is that the addict isn't your stereotypical user. Many people start off with very, like you had, legitimate pain problems and then find themselves hooked. Others perhaps are users who have now find a legal, found a legal way to get high. Uh, here now is the story of one woman who's overcome her addiction and is on the road to recovery. Sherry Reeves describes her lifelong battle with migraines as a living nightmare. Automatically sick to your stomach like every 20 minutes for six hours. Meanwhile, just totally feeling like someone was stabbing me in my left eye, my whole incorporated neck and shoulder, and the back, always the same place, back left part of my head just felt like an atomic bomb was going off constantly. The pain so severe, she routinely considered suicide. Reeves isn't sure if the migraines were congenital or a byproduct of her traumatic childhood. Raised by a single mother, she claims to have suffered sexual abuse at the hands of her own father. She also says her father first exposed her to illegal drugs. Cocaine, heroin, barbiturates, acid, ash, smoking pot, all that kind of stuff. 
Her Shaken Family Foundation contributed to Sherry's clinically diagnosed anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and bipolar disorder. She claims her fragile mental state left her looking for ways to numb both her physical pain from the headaches and her emotional pain from the abuse. I did everything I could do to find alternate substances to, you know, not feel, not be in pain, not feel. An addict but functional, Sherry started working as a jeweler while still in high school, a craft she loves and practices even today. She credits the profession with saving her life. As Sherry matured, her street drug craving waned, but her addiction to prescription pills, strong narcotics, synthetic heroin, was all-consuming. I took furanol with codeine, an incredible amount of that, uh, morphine, a lot of benzodiazepams, Valium, Xanax, Lorazepam, just handfuls of those. And I was able at that time to function because, I guess because I was young enough and the resiliency of, you know, taking that much drugs didn't start to break down my health yet. Sherry never thought of herself as an addict. And it was prescribed by doctors, so how could it be bad? So for 35 years, this was her lifestyle in the fast lane. She continued working as a jeweler until the drugs finally caught up with her. A family intervention landed Sherry at the Willow Treatment Facility in November of 2009. She describes the detox as debilitating, but something stuck. I felt like there were ants crawling through my veins trying to get out underneath my skin. My, my skin was felt like hot to the touch, yet I was sweating like full time, sick to my stomach, throwing up nonstop for three days, a headache that would kill 10 men. Sherry completed 28 days inpatient treatment, and despite being skeptical about living pain-free, she's maintained her sobriety. She says she's been able to stay clean because of a new pill called Suboxone, which she claims has wiped away her headaches and her craving for narcotics. I don't know how I lived. And the message is hope. Dr. Lado treated Sherry, helping her on her journey into sobriety. So, Dr. Lado, what what worked for Sherry this time? The saddest part about her story is that I wish she would have seen me sooner. Ah. She wouldn't have to suffer. This the 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 saddest part also uh, was that uh, there were there was medication Suboxone available to help her. What worked for her was the uh, getting off the meds and put her on Suboxone. One of the things that Suboxone have and very few physicians are becoming aware of is that it has a pain quality. So if you suffer from pain and you're escalating in dose on painkillers, you can substitute that with Suboxone. And Suboxone, even though it's not indicated at this moment for pain, it's an incredible pain uh, killer. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, we talked a little earlier about how these opioid type medications give you that euphoric feeling, this incredible relaxation, making you feel numb. How do you talk to people about, okay, well, now we're taking the drugs away. How do they learn to feel? I think the biggest challenge when they're off the medicines and the physical symptomatology, they begin to face some of their realities, and the reality is some of the memories that got them there. And I say to them, welcome to reality. Welcome mm. to the world. And this is what normality feels like. Mm -hmm. And the more therapy you do with them, they begin to accept that this is normality. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about doctor shopping, if you will, because it yeah. is a practice that happens and people, we certainly do hear about it. You're an advocate for a monitoring system and a central registry. Correct. We heard earlier how we have the law on the books, but no funding for it. How can doctors have, I guess, access to other pharmacist records so you can know if a patient is doing this doctor shopping? Two choices. They can purchase a software. Uh, electronic health record systems now have a built-in, um, uh, for example, something we call e-prescribe or new crop systems. I've had a system like this for five years. Ability is a new company that seems to be uh, providing uh, pre-certification, has a built-in pharmacy. They call it CARE. Uh, I think it may have the ability to go into the pharmacy systems. The, pres the prescription system that I have it allows me to see what patients are taking uh, when I, before I prescribe, so okay. I can see their profile. Yeah. All right.
Uh, well, you certainly do treat patients across the board. Correct. You also do work at the Willow at Naples Recovery Center. Yes. And I want to thank you because you invited us to see I'm your treatment welcome. team. You're yeah. welcome. And to hear from the nurses and the therapists at the Willow that are really committed to helping those addicted. I think the problem in Southwest Florida is unlike anything I've ever seen. I've worked in Baltimore and Park Heights, which is the heroin capital of the country. I've worked in New York, I've worked in DC, I've been all over. And coming down to Southwest Florida, I've realized that the problem with prescription opiate medication is just rampant. It's incredible, it's everywhere. Jen Ferriola is on the front lines battling addiction. She is one part of a very personal team working at the Willow in Naples, trying to help addicts break free of their dependence on drugs. People like Julie, who is in rehab. All right, Julie, nothing changes. This is this your first time in the treatment team? Or have you been here before? I'm prescribed Xanax, so I would, you know, overdo it or whatever, but uh, take it not as it's supposed to be prescribed. Like Julie, Stephen also got addicted to prescription drugs. He's just completed treatment. About 10 years ago, after I had my accident, I started seeing pain doctors. And um, they prescribed me oxys and roxys, and um, I got hooked on them. When I used to run out of pills, I used to drink and take street drugs. It was migraine pain that spurred Rebecca's journey into addiction. She was quickly hooked. The Roxy's were just available. So that's what, that seems to be the Florida drug of choice because everybody I talked to, they were the Roxy Cotton, Roxy's, Roxy's, Roxy's. I mean, I, I mean, it's just so available. She couldn't believe just how easy it was to get. They have pain clinics that you just go and pay cash and you say you have a back problem, migraines, anything, and bam, they'll write you a script for 180 Roxy Cottons just like that. But just, it is that simple. Sadly, therapist Jen Ferriola has heard these stories from patients many times over. The opiates, the Roxyset, the Roxycontin, the Oxycontin, Percocet, Percodan, the Lortabs, and the Vicodins, these are rampant. There is no control on what people can be prescribed. So a lot of people go to pain management clinics, and because there's no intermingling between pain management doctors, they'll get a prescription for 180 pills and then go to another doctor the following day, get another prescription for another 180. Many addicts only take some of the pills. They sell the rest on the street to fund their addiction. And Leslie, I'd like to talk with you since you've kind of walked the walk. Did you do some of that, what we just heard about, that doctor shopping to get more and more pills? Absolutely, I would, I would doctor shop, I would manipulate the pharmacy system, I would doctor shop, and um, Sadly, I, I started uh, actually producing my own prescriptions. So yeah, I, w when I decided to finally go get treatment, I was, I was looking at, yeah, seven felonies. Really? So yeah, I was a high school teacher and 12 credits shy of my PhD. Wow, and you had never really dabbled in illicit drugs prior to getting the hook toward these prescription pain meds. No, I, I mean, I had drank alcohol sure. as, as a, as a youth, but I really, Me too. you know, I'd never tried, <laughs> I'd never tried anything that um, I thought was going to be, yeah. you know, something that was going to push me over the edge. And I think um, I was protecting myself from getting out of control the way that I did so quickly. Mm -hmm. It was really devastating. And people you know, um, you must feel lucky because you were sharing the story of, we have a roommate who recently passed because um, they couldn't overcome the addiction. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, a lot of, I'm seeing just 20-year-olds dying left and right, people around that age range, and they have so much, so much to give. Yeah. And they don't mean to, to overdose. They don't mean to kill themselves. They just want to use one more time and, you know, have that high one more time. Well, I want to mention, too, because you're also the marketing director for Hyde Park Treatment Center in the Tampa area. We have Swafis. We have Dr. Lado with the Lado Healing Institute. We have Hazelden. We have all these types of people here in our studios that are willing to help you or somebody you love. And again, we'd really love to hear from you if you have gone through this or if you need help. There you see the number to call. We do have a few calls coming in. Um, this one is for... 
from Susan, I should say, in Fort Myers. Um, Brenda, I would like you to answer this one. Is the 12-step model, she asks, appropriate for prescription addiction moderation? Actually, the 12-step model is really for people that are looking at abstinence from all mood-altering chemicals. So Narcotics Anonymous, their major focus is to help people get off of narcotics. Alcoholics Anonymous, the only requirement to belong is the desire to quit drinking. So the 12-step model is generally um, focused on total abstinence from all mood-altering chemicals, and it's wonderful for recovery. It's a grassroots organization where you, there's no dues, there's no fees. People can come and one addict helps another, and that's what it all boils down to, even in many of our treatment programs one addict reaching out to another. We have another unnamed caller who would like the panel to discuss benzodiazepines and identify the different types. Kevin, would you like to take well, that? Well, it's a good, we talked about that earlier, benzodiazepines, Valium, Librium, Xanax, mm -hmm. are minor tranquilizers, which were drugs of huge abuse in the 60s, are now drugs of huge abuse again. Mm. And oftentimes, individuals that are involved with the use of opiates are using benzodiazepines as well. Benzodiazepines combined with alcohol very dangerous mm. in terms of the potential synergistic effect mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also have a much more difficult withdrawal. Again, more difficult physiologically than uh, alcohol and benzodiazepines are the ones folks can actually die from through withdrawal, so they need medical supervision. This next call I think is very important. Bill from Fort Myers wants to know then what can you do if someone you love has this addiction problem and they just flat out won't go to help. Do you seek an intervention? Do you, what do you do? Well, I think one of the things you know is you can get help. And oftentimes individuals ah. will participate and gain education as family members or friends. And they can start the recovery process and then determine what they can do to assist someone else. Ironically, most people don't wake up and want to be addicted. Yeah. And most people don't wake up and want to get recovery either. Uh, most okay. people are like Leslie's story and others. There's some adversity that happens that initially causes people to seek help. From that adversity, then you get to engage the individual until it becomes an internal drive. Gotcha. That's the challenge. All right. I'd like to share now a statistic from Collier County where Hazelden has recently opened its treatment center. In Collier County, every 72 hours, a juvenile presents to a hospital ER as a result of a drug or alcohol overdose. A juvenile. Now, this study also found that 85% of all juvenile criminal cases are substance related and that most drug related deaths occur from the legal use of prescription drugs. Brenda Hazelden really recently opened there. Um, do you find that pretty shocking? When I hear juvenile, I, I, my jaw kind of drops a little bit. Well, you know, young people have age working against them because one of the pieces that's part of being a young person is thinking that you're invincible and this mm -hmm. won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. So when you say about the young person that says, you know, one more high, or we say, well, you're going to die. Young people don't think that way. The other piece that they have working against them is the brain is still developing. So you add chemicals to any developing brain. You know, you think about it when it's in, in utero, a little baby, the developing brain gets damaged. Well, the same is true for adolescents and young adults. The brain really doesn't fully get developed till it's like people are like 22, 24. So even if they live through the addiction, there can be some long-term mm, effects. Okay, I do want to talk about another substance issue and that is alcohol, despite the pill problems we are facing. Mm -hmm. Brenda, alcohol remains the number one drug problem in America, and it's also the number one drug people die from during withdrawal. Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. A lot of the opiates people won't die in withdrawal of. They'll feel like they're gonna mm -hmm. die and they'll tell you they're gonna die, but they probably won't die. What happens with so many people, right? Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm gonna die, head, you know? Yeah, really no, feel terrible. <laughs> and then you had the benzos and they're anxious and it's, it, it really is a horrible withdrawal as you spoke about. Um, but alcohol is the number one drug people die in withdrawal of because what happens is you take a depressant, it depresses the body. Well, any drug, the detox is the opposite effect of the, of the, the drug. So like meth gets you going real fast. Well, what, do you, what happens when you detox from meth or cocaine? You fall asleep. Nothing really happens, you know. But alcohol, everything starts going faster and faster and faster, and people seize and have DTs and die. So and the brain doesn't know the difference between alcohol and another drug. It and just then, knows jackpot. Right. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, well, a statewide crackdown is making sure alcoholic beverages are not getting into the hands of young people under the age of 21. The latest effort we want to talk to you about was called Operation Boutonniere 
bust. Of course, it happened around prom time and our cameras were granted special permission to ride along with undercover agents to see firsthand if local stores were selling booze to minors. We do the best we can to keep alcohol out of the hands of underage. To protect their identity, we're not showing the faces of the undercover agents or the minor working with the state's Division of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco. Routinely, these agents travel the roads through the seven counties in their jurisdiction, looking to see if any licensed establishments, bars, or convenience stores are willing to sell booze to a minor with an ID clearly under 21. We try to hit about 10 to 15, and uh, we always normally end up with one or two. Sometimes we get lucky and we get more, sometimes we strike out. It works like this. A minor, typically a teen called the investigative aide, walks into a convenience store and heads for the beer and wine. She decides what she'd like to purchase and carries it to the counter. I trailed behind with a hidden camera to see if the clerks were willing to take the bait. No, she wants me to go in jail. On this night, time after time, the teen would enter a store and get turned down. No. This clerk's reaction is exactly what ABT Captain Sabrina Maxwell hopes to see in terms of convenience store clerks complying with the law. It is a crime to allow underage persons to consume alcoholic beverages for you to sell it to them, allow them to consume it. Also, studies have shown under the age of 21, their brains are still developing, so it harms them. Studies also show alcohol is the most prevalent mood-altering substance used by youth, and it can be the gateway to other drugs. We've seen where youth has gone um, and consumed alcoholic beverages underage, jumped in a vehicle, and caused a fatality. This evening, nine times out of ten, convenience store clerks did not break the law. Some even had an idea they were being targeted. Was that girl trying to buy and she was not old enough? It's under COVID. The responses were all similar until we walked into our final convenience store on Palm Beach Boulevard in Lee County. We just got a positive buy. The clerk sells the minor alcohol. Our volunteer walks back to the cruiser where ABT agents secure her safety. They collect the money and the evidence. He looks like to be the only guy in there, so I'll have to shut the doors. Agents enter the store to question the clerk. I'm with the Division of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco. All right. Unfortunately, you just sold alcohol to a minor. The clerk is having trouble understanding and providing proper identification. He is cuffed and the store closed temporarily. You got to check the IDs so you don't get in trouble. The store's owner is also called. Are you the manager of the Sunoco here at 3006 Palm Beach Boulevard? Okay. Is there any way that you can come up to the store for a few minutes? I'm with uh, While agents wait, the clerk is arrested. Because he's having trouble providing proper ID, he'll be taken to jail for processing instead of being issued a written summons. Uh, yeah, so mm. And we do want to check the phone bank once again to remind you that we are here live to take your calls. And if you need help or want to share a comment, that number is on your screen. We do have some calls coming in. Sean from Inglewood uh, is a caller that has two sons addicted and has a long family history. Dr. Latto, I want you to take this one. Is there really a genetic factor in addiction? He addiction has a genetic component. And there's another component that's being neglected, but we're looking at it more. It's called comorbidity or co-occurrence. There seems to be a high propensity to people to self-medicate symptoms that seem to be evolving as they grow older. And uh, the, the primary symptom that they're self-medicating is called anxiety. I will mm. tell you for a fact that if you have no chronic pain and you're addicted to opioid, at least in my practice, all if uh, 89 to 100 percent of my patients are off the opioids. Normally, they have other problems like bipolar disorder, which is another illness that's being underdiagnosed, anxiety disorders. When you treat that, the addiction usually subsides. Leslie, you could probably talk a little bit about that, too, because, you know, a lot of times there is that underlying anxiety that maybe makes the person who is addicted seek out the pain relief. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, those of us that are addicted to drugs um, have several of those things all rolled into one sometimes. Mm. But uh, yes, I, I, I personally, it took 30 days 
plus for them to be able to diagnose me properly. Okay. And like since then, it's gotten a lot easier. Regarding the genetics, really quick, uh, the gen genes just tell you that something may happen. The environment simply makes it happen. Yeah. Mm. This is from an unnamed caller. Kevin, what treatment is available if somebody wants help but has no money or insurance? Okay. There's publicly funded a treatment in all, all three of the counties through this region, Charlotte, Lee, and uh, Collier. David Lawrence in Collier County can provide treatment. Charlotte Behavioral Health in Charlotte County and Southwest Florida Addiction Services or Lee Mental Health in Lee County. Now, what we run into, frankly, are waiting lists sometimes for certain levels of care. Okay. If a person wanted to get into detox right now, they may wait three to four days because of the fact that we have many more people needing to get in than we have publicly funded capacity. Kevin, are you finding that sometimes, very sadly, people are dying while they're waiting? We have had that happen on occasion, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah no question about it. Uh, this is from an, another unnamed caller, and any one of the panelists, feel free to take it. What is the solution of the person who has legitimate pain issues? I think, if I, if I may, the panel sure. may permit me, I think if you have pain, you have to be treated. I think that the, the pain options are much better and I think that the best option right now, if you have pain, knowing that a lot of these opioids have a uh, what's called high dependency level, is that the newer drugs such as Suboxone and Subutex are a better option to control your pain with associated medications. Dr. Latta, why are so many doctors prescribing so many? So say I have a toothache, a migraine, knee pain. Do I really need a prescription for 30, 80, 100? Can I just get 10 to get me through? You know, I think dentists will only write for a short supply. Uh, I but think we're that hearing stories, Dr. Lotto. I've heard mm -hmm. through this investigation of people getting just so okay. many pills. You know, I think, that, um, I think that there's also a mindset in doctors is that if this person, I give them a short supply, they might come back for more, so I might as well give them a large supply so they don't come back again. So it's a quick way of saying, don't come back again. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's an assumption, but that there is no need to prescribe that many right. for short-term pain. And we do want to point out, you know, not all pain management Correct. places do Correct. this. Not all doctors over-prescribe. You know, sometimes the bad apple spoils the Correct. bunch, but um, I do want to make that point. But Kath as a consumer, you can say, I just need four. I just need six. Very you can say that to your pharmacist too. So we tell people in recovery to to say, I'll, "I'll come back on Monday if I need more." You know, it holds people accountable. So. And you have to be proactive. I I actually have some legitimate pain management issues. Right. And had I walked into my physician's office, I would have prescribed me those medications as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a scary thing, but there are other ways of dealing with it. You know, yeah, it's a pain in the butt to have to go to physical therapy twice a week. But I do it, and it's been three weeks since I've even had to take an ibuprofen. There's yeah. other ways to manage yeah. your pain mm -hmm. than that quick fix that my generation okay. wants. Well, sadly, 25% Americans, this is pretty shocking, die every year because of substance abuse. That's one in four. Take a look at these numbers here, too. Drug and alcohol abuse is at the root of 50% of traffic deaths, 61% of criminal arrests, 65% child abuse cases, 75% of divorces, 93% of all juvenile crime and violence. Addiction touches the lives of nearly everyone. And let's now have a listen to your voice. I grew up in a house with a drug addict dad. Um, didn't find out till I was in middle school that it was drugs, um, primarily cocaine, alcohol. Um, did drugs myself through high school. Um, got into pot and a lot of alcohol. And the more I looked in the mirror and didn't like what I see, the more I went out and drank and used drugs. I would come home from work and start a fight just so I could go out. I came from a dad who was an alcoholic. I, my, then I married into it. The last thing that I thought I would do was marry the same, but it was hidden. I got hurt on the job. I ran heavy equipment for many years, and I blew some disc out, and they started giving me just uh, Vicodin, Percocet. I was never into pills before, and then the next thing I know, I got hooked on them. I just got off probation. Um, I was on crack. I was dealing, selling, and um, when I got clean and sober, I was 82 pounds. I was a hardcore drunken biker, and... Um, now, um, uh, easy to get along with Christian individual, I guess. And the message here is there is hope. There are many ways to recover in terms of treatment. We've been talking about it here on this panel. We have Swafis Hazelton, The Willow, David Lawrence Center, Hyde Park, Dr. Lato's facility. My question, are all of these particular 
programs enough or is the problem now so bad that we need more kevin i think that the data tells us we're treating about one in ten people that has a substance use disorder in the united states mm -hmm. right now and, uh, and as i said publicly funded facilities have wait lists so clearly that's not adequate the other thing though you have to understand is not everybody has to get the same type of experience many people receive and achieve recovery through work with a medical doctor many people will achieve it through 12-step programming or self-help some through faith-based programs so there's many ways to get to recovery very interesting and i want to point out that kathleen from port charlotte who is a mental health counselor um, just gave a comment and we want to get your comments in as many as we can her experience is that pain meds are overtaking alcohol pot cocaine use she sees a lot of doctor shopping and then the people as we've shown selling medication on the streets shirley from cape coral wants to know what is the best relapse prevention anybody want to take that one what is Leslie maybe do you know you know what I, I do to maintain my recovery is I work a 12-step based program which means I'm, I'm a member of um, Alcoholics Anonymous I go to Alcoholics Anonymous I go to Narcotics Anonymous my husband goes to Al Anon we actually make a date night of it and you know I do the things necessary to take care of myself I work my life into my recovery instead of trying to work my recovery into my hectic life. Okay. I think the biggest problem is self-deception. You need to have an external monitor of yourself. When you begin to change the rules and you begin to justify, your monitor needs to say, hey, self-deception is kicking in, you're going to relapse. Interesting. Yeah. Something we haven't talked about yet that I do want to talk about is this interesting statistic here. It says 70% of teens who have abused prescription drugs took them from friends or family. So this is a product here. We've all seen celebrity rehab or intervention uh, endorsed by Dr. Drew with that show that it's basically for parents if they have legitimate pain needs they can lock their meds in here. So my question is is this really a deterrent or I mean okay. if, if a teen is going in they can break it or whatever but at least the parent then knows right? It's a new toy for them to figure out how to break in okay. Because, okay. <laughs> but, it's, but it's, it's, it's something to send a message that they're, that they're trying to stop them from using drugs. Well, it's not unlike the, uh, <laughs> the light on your dashboard it says cars overheating. Right. If that happens you've got something to look at it gives you an indicator. Mm -hmm. All right. It's a warning. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair well, enough. A lot of people have those 40 pills from the one time they had a root canal right. mm -hmm. in there, and so they don't even think they have the drugs mm -hmm. in their cabinet, and so it's real easy for kids to grab them from grandpa and grandma. So take a look at what you have in your cabinet. And, and you know what, a very good point to that, I'm so glad you brought that up, Brenda, is in Collier County, they have prescription drug drop boxes yes. at several facilities across the county where they don't want you to flush the pills anymore. So right. you bring them to one of these locations, there's one downtown and throughout the facility. Um, Yes, so they don't get into the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. I've heard of those locations. No, I don't. that was a joke. <laughs> well, Kevin, you were just saying that people do find sobriety in a number of ways, and statistics show people believing in a higher power often have a better chance of staying sober than those without religion. Whatever your religious preference, we thought we'd show you one local program that is church-affiliated, but it's free of charge, and it works. It's a celebration of spirit and sobriety. A place where people can go for fellowship, friendship, a hot meal, and help staying sober. My name is John. I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from drugs and alcohol. John Leonard leads the recovery ministry, welcoming people who have hurts, habits, or hang-ups. This church embraces the fact that we're, we're all wounded people. Centered around the 12 steps, every Friday night, up to 500 people gather for help on their journey. I started using drinking and drugging back in the middle school or junior high school back in the early 70s when I was about 12, 13 years old. John Leonard shares their path. The good example is I've been around the world three times and I don't remember most of it. You know, I mean, I've been to the pyramids of Egypt and the only reason why I know that is because I got pictures. And like many seeking hope at Grace Church, John's addictions consumed his life. And I drank 24-7. If I was awake, I was drinking. I had this 32-ounce cup, and uh, I would fill it with rum and put about that much pink flamingo <laughs> Kool-Aid in it. And that was my drink, and I had four or five of those a day. Severe health problems led John to AA on August 21st, 1997. He also joined his family at church, connecting to a higher power. 
I asked that pastor to pray for me and remove the obsession. And uh, I haven't drank since. I haven't drank since, and it'll be 13 years this year. John knows many of the people here will travel different paths getting and staying sober. He shares what worked for him. All we're doing is planting the seeds that if and when, you know, you need an answer for a solution that you can't figure out the answer for, this might be it. And we do have time to take more viewer calls, comments, questions. I have one now. It's unnamed. So, uh, Dr. Lotto, this is for you. Are all psychiatrists capable to treat addiction? Is there special certification required? It's not just psychiatrists. There's a lot of wannabes out there who suddenly get these wannabe licenses. The truth is, uh, I like to make a comment. It's not the quality, quantity of centers. It's the quantity and the quality of it. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not the quantity, the it's number. The quality, it's how the good quality, they right. are. Okay. You, just because you can prescribe doesn't mean you know your pharmacology. While we're talking to you, a 69-year-old female has just been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and prescribed... I don't know them, wants to know if these meds are addictive and I'm going to, she doesn't want to end up in treatment. Well, uh, first of all, uh, she's taking Lamodotrine and Depakote. They're okay. not addicting. The only thing she has to be aware about is that uh, because of her age, these drugs can cause cognitive impairment and uh, you have to be careful how they're combined. Okay. So these are very good drugs for bipolar, but I also have to question her cognitive ability because at the age of 69, she may have some memory deficits that may be related to that. Pete in Fort Myers wants to know, how can I detox off Lexapro? I can't work and have no life, sadly. Uh, Brenda or Kevin? Yeah. I think yeah. 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 Uh, Lexapro, there's nothing to detox. What he's right. worried about is called the serotonergent withdrawal syndrome. And it's a syndrome that's manifested by tremors, sweating. You can come off any SSRI. The question I have for him is why doesn't he like it? Is he not functioning with it? Is he not doing well with it? I believe that if something is working, don't change it, you know? Okay, okay. I see a lot of people in recovery that they start to feel better, and, you know, six months into it, they just quit their meds, and they get into it like a discontinuation syndrome, whether it's Prozac, Paxil. So just do it with a doctor's supervision. Okay. There's mindset. If, uh, if your heart is broken, you can fix it. If your kidneys are broken, you can fix it, but don't touch my brain. Mm, interesting. The brain is just a piece of tissue. Ed from Naples is a caller who has a 20-year-old son, two months clean off of Oxys. What are his chances of staying clean without treatment or with treatment? I think it's, we, we know addiction is a chronic disease, okay? So he's, he's at risk, just like if you were diabetes. Can he successfully manage recovery? Yes. He'll be more likely to do that if he has support to do that, however. And that support, as we know, can come through formal mechanisms through treatment. It can come through informal mechanisms. Uh, but the disease doesn't go away, and that's what people need to understand. The chronicity of the disease doesn't disappear. All right, a no-named caller here, 66 years old, takes two oxys per day for a bad back and is concerned that she may become addicted. Is there education available for this caller? Yeah, there is. There's education available. Um, one of the things that I, I thought was so interesting about um, what, when I, opiate abusers that are have pain management issues, they have, um, a lot of them have told me that they, they were taking the medicine as prescribed properly from the beginning, as, as was, I was also taking it properly. Okay. And it takes a hold of you in a weird sort of way that is undescribable to somebody who's not an addict. It just takes over your life. And the education that, that I would suggest that you get she can get from her doctor. So the doctor should be saying, hey, listen, I'm going to prescribe this for you, but this is highly addictive. Yeah, and the and even more important thing is that the doctor has to be aware of what she's actually taking at that moment. Okay. Uh, we got about a minute right, left in the show. I want to get this question in. It's Lisa in Fort Myers. She says, what about prevention programs in the schools? Is DARE active? Uh, DARE is not active, and unfortunately, DARE didn't prove to be overly effective either. In that. So there are, there are some prevention programs that exist in schools. They're fairly hit and miss, unfortunately. Okay. They aren't well distributed, uh, but there are some very good evidence-based programs. We know that the number one prevention factor is parents. Okay. And we can't, we can't abdicate our roles as parents. They're the number one influence over young people. Drug-free Southwest Florida, I know they're watching. Um, sit down and have dinner with your children. Right. This was a big mm -hmm. uh, movement that right. really helps. Okay, I know we're less than 30 seconds. Seniors and alcoholism in our area, big problem, Brenda? Big problem, big problem. In Florida, big problem all over because as we age, our bodies react different to chemicals. So what people could drink 
years ago, they can't because they, they metabolize it different. If they're a woman, add that about triple. So it's a okay. huge problem in our area. I'd just like to end it. There's a, there's a magic, there's a, a very poor uh, uh, formula. Too much time, too much money, and nothing to do at the beginning and a prescription for addiction. Mm. And this is what happens in retirement. You're retired, you have some money, and your sense of nothing to do kicks in. Yeah. Okay. I'll, go ahead, Leslie. Benzodiazepines, opiates, drugs like these prescription drugs are taking a lot shorter amount of time to make us hit fall to our knees mm -hmm. than alcohol. Had I not run into the fentanyl, I would have been 73 years old sitting in, mm -hmm. okay. in Hazelden. And we could mm -hmm. talk about this right. on and on yeah. and on. It's certainly been a hot topic. I want to remind you, our phone bank is still open, so if you have any advice or need help, and we want to let you know that we certainly hope we have armed you with some information, disposing maybe this pill epidemic that's happening locally and perhaps offering some solutions if you find yourself needing help. A very special thank you goes out to you, all of our panelists, for your insights. Our phone bank volunteers uh, from Hazelden, Chick, and Barbara Bancroft as well for taking your calls. And finally, a thanks to you. It's always our mission to have your voice heard. Good night. Support for your voice, Addicted, comes from Edison State College with campuses in Lee, Collier, Charlotte counties and a center serving Hendry and Glades. Edison State College, discover your genius.